Welcome into Just a Bit Outside, presented by Wafed Bank. Join the best bank at wafedbank.com. I'm Michelle Ledka. We've got a great show this week as I go one on one with Katie Nida, the woman who made history on the football field. We talk where sports currently are at in our country and where we can still improve. But let's check in on our hot topics presented by Wafed Bank first as our experts weigh in from the sidelines. Joining us now here on Just a Bit Outside from Q13 Sports, Aaron Levine from NBC Sports Northwest, Joe Fan, and the legendary Casey Keller. And Casey, I was trying to figure out how to introduce you and literally going through your resume, I was like, I can't even list any of it because it would just put the rest of us to shame. Just Casey's fine. Well, and the segment would be over by the time you finish <laughs> introducing him. So. Uh, well, thank you guys so much for joining us from the sidelines today. Yeah, no, our pleasure. Awesome. Let's jump right in. Our first topic of today uh, is a, a situation that a, a lot of us saw on SportsCenter, on the headlines and everything earlier this week. LeBron James and his team back in action. And in the NBA, there are some fans that are being allowed to attend games at certain areas and stuff. Um, surprisingly enough, it's courtside seats that are being let in. And, and there was um, a very um, unfortunate incident between LeBron James and a female fan and that was recorded and there a lot of people had a lot of things to say about it. Uh, my question for you guys, did you see the video? What'd you think? Is there a boundary of crossing a line between fandom and your ultimate fandom and just being obnoxious? I think there's, there's always a boundary. Um, everything that I've always experienced was there was always a boundary for players, never a boundary for fans. Uh, I think it, it kind of reminds me back to Kind of the mid '90s in England, when uh, a fan uh, came down and said something to Eric Cantona, uh, the famous Manchester United player at Crystal Palace, and Cantona, he he kind of ran down to the sign boards and said something, and Cantona took uh, two, three steps, jumped over the sign board, and karate kicked him in the chest. Um, got a good. Uh, Got a good suspension after that, but it was, I remember talking about it on, on, on English TV and radio afterwards and kind of saying how every player, you know, has always wanted to do something like that to an unruly fan, but you, you just don't do it, right? And, and I tried to say, but the, the argument in England always was that, well, you make so much money that you basically have signed over your right to be abused for the length of the game. And, and I kind of said, well, okay, I mean, is it any different than let's say you were at your job stocking shelves at the supermarket and for 90 minutes each day, I get to call you every expletive and uh, for that time while you're at your job doing your work. So yeah, I think there's always been, uh, unfortunately, there's been an exception that, uh, that players have had to just accept that they were going to be abused for a long period of time. And that's all you, you just had to take it. I think that being a sports fan oftentimes brings out the worst in all of us. I think all of us have probably had moments, we're not specifically like what Casey's referencing, but um, there is such an emotion to it. It becomes this kind of mob mentality. I will say, I do think there's an art to being a heckler and not many people have it, but I'll tell you a story from, from my experience getting to see it firsthand. I used to cover the Niners and I used to work for the team. So I would arrive uh, to then CenturyLink field, and you come through, buses are dropped off, and you kind of walk right through the opposing, the visiting team's tunnel, or the, the, where the sounders walk out, same, same tunnel. And there's a guy who would get there the moment doors open and would be in that corner where players come out. And every single player and staff member that walked out, he'd have something for him. And he'd be yelling all sorts of stuff. 84, literally no one knows who you are. He did research on Cassius Marsh and Cassius Marsh, big Magic the Gathering player. It was reported he had like 20 grand worth of cards stolen from, uh, from, his, from his car. Hey, Cassius, sorry you got your Pokemon card stolen. He, I walk out. He makes fun of the suit I'm wearing. I mean, and I, it's, you can't help but laugh to it. I mean, he was just, he was relentless. But it was funny. But not many people have that in them. So uh, there's there's a very thin line of where you're able to go. But um, some people, it's kind of like being the class clown that some kids just get away with more than others because uh, it, it's hard not to laugh. So I do think there's a time and place for the well-trained heckler. 
Yeah, the prepared heckler I actually like, and I know exactly who you're talking about, Joe, because he's still out there, at least hopefully when fans come back too. I think he wears a Matt Hasselbeck jersey to every single game. Uh, this might be a wild theory also. That I think the world of social media has actually emboldened some people to say even more bad things without repercussions. And because of this, courtside Karen gets thrown out of the game, and what does she do? She immediately takes to TikTok or wherever she's on, and she goes on a rant, and she becomes even more famous after that. Um, I'm also at this point having a bit of a tough time with stadiums and arenas allowing fans while others don't. And I have a major issue with it. I did during football season also. I don't know, you know, I know these teams are private businesses, but they're all businesses as part of an overall league. And I personally think this league has a responsibility to say, hey, we're all in this together. It's potentially providing an edge for home teams that can't have fans compared to home teams that can't. Let's have a league-wide mandate for how many fans, if any, can attend games. I know I, I live in this sort of utopian idea sense, but and it's not possible, but that's kind of how I feel. I personally really liked it when LeBron, in his post-game press conferences, will, was saying how, well, you know, some of the fans, they have the ability to indulge in alcoholic beverages during the game. We don't. I like that he was trying to give courtside Karen a little maybe out, but... Regardless, it made for some entertaining talk this week. Uh, moving on to our next topic, kind of split between Major League Baseball and Major League Soccer. They're kind of the next sports to get up and get going. Uh, there's been talk between both leagues about kind of pushing back spring training or preseason um, and then a start, kind of a modified start to the season. MLB has kind of stopped with their plan after the players union said they didn't want to. Soccer, the players union and, and is still working things out. Do you guys think this is smart? Do you think that players should be, you know, money aside, should they be taking these kind of um, deals from leagues or kind of what's your stance on getting these next round of sports started? I'll jump in first on this. Uh, I think the biggest story here is the MLB Players Association in the league and the amount of distrust that exists between those two sides. Uh, the owners could say, hey, we're going to cancel the full season and give you double your salary and they still would would say we don't we, there's some loophole here they're trying to get us that's such a fractured relationship that i'm not sure how they move forward because it does feel like there's going to be a tipping point where uh things truly fall apart between those two sides and it's going to get uglier than it already has it was such a mess last year with those two sides trying to figure out when they were going to play baseball again ultimately it worked out the dodgers were crowned world series champions um, but here we go again in terms of the safety and the ability to play, I think you'd already played one season. I don't, I don't necessarily see why, given all the other sports that are happening, why it can't be done safely, you know, and how far are you pushing it back? What's the difference from a week or two, a you know, week or two or a month? Uh, I think the show must go on and uh, you can find ways to do it safely. Well, I think the big reason why they would contemplate pushing it back is they think that gives them more time to get fans in the stadium. And when you're talking about, you know, major league soccer in particular, uh, a vast majority of the revenue stream comes from match day experience as opposed to, you know, other leagues. I mean, the, the Mariners make a far more money off of TV rights and everything else than they do from match day experience. So for them just to be playing, you know, makes, makes a lot of sense. I think when it comes to CBA negotiations, you know, nothing ever gets done till the 11th hour anyway. So if, if, if major league soccer hadn't set a date to start, what was the point of negotiating against yourself? So, so now the two sides are working very hard uh, to come up with, with, with something reasonable. I think when you're looking at COVID, you're looking at the situations of, of how much the owners lost uh, in MLS in particular. Um, I just can't imagine that the players wouldn't come to an agreement with the owners. The owners want to get going. The players want to play and uh, they'll figure it out. The problem with Major League Soccer was setting that deadline last week and saying, oh, well, we passed this deadline. Nobody really cared. We're going to set another deadline for a week from today. I mean, how much uh, you have to be strict with some of those deadlines unless there was actual uh, progress and negotiations happening. I think Joe touched in on it also, though. I think there was already a major divide between the leagues and the players associations to begin with. And now that you add the pandemic and the financial effects from that, it's, it's created an even bigger wedge between the two sides. It does come down to trust. There is a major distrust between the players and the owner side and the owners not being able to open their books to show the players exactly how much money is being made or how much money is being lost. We, we saw it with players in MLS saying that the owners were using the extended pandemic as an excuse to try and get a better deal than they originally agreed to last June. And the owners are claiming a billion dollar loss uh, in the end. 
I could actually see MLS being delayed this year. And this could really get ugly when the baseball owners and the players are kind of forced to try and hash out a deal after this season. Right. The biggest problem with the delay in, in, in particularly in MLS is you have such a huge discrepancy in salaries between players on the same club where some guys, you know, very clearly have the ability to ride out some time because of the money they've made in the game. And, and other guys that are, you know, more or less making the same wage that your local barista is making. So it, yeah, it's, uh, it's tough then to say the person that, that really has no savings that's li living, you know, from, from month to month then, and, and the guy that's making multi-millions a year. So that's always a, a tricky scenario when you're dealing with MLS in particular. Very good points there, you guys. Uh, moving on kind of to our last and final topic, we've got the Super Bowl this weekend. Um, I want to know who you're taking in the game, who do you think is going to win, any score predictions, and also, do you, I mean, they've come clear and said that the game won't be changed. Like, it for sure is going to play on Sunday, no matter if there's COVID um, issues with certain players, including Patrick Mahomes and Tom Brady. Um, they're going to push forward. Could you imagine a Super Bowl without Patrick Mahomes and Tom Brady if that's the case on Sunday? I can't. No, I think it's it's something that they're going to say, but circumstances change. I think they are crossing all their fingers and toes that Tom Brady and Patrick Mahomes don't get COVID. The issue is you're not delaying it a day or two. You're potentially pushing it back a week, and the logistics would be such a nightmare. So um, it probably would be feasibly um, – I mean, the NFL is such a big organization. They can move heaven and earth to make it happen, but – it would come at such a great expense. I think they are just hoping those guys are in bubbles and um, and can make it through and, and, and this thing will go forward. And I think everyone will take a huge sigh of relief just that the season happened, uh, a Super Bowl champion was crowned, and they can move forward into the offseason and hope that, you know, stadiums are packed and, and things are more back to normal next fall. Who do you got, Joe? Uh, I'm going to take the Chiefs just because I – yeah, you don't want to bet. It's hard to bet against either guy, but Patrick Mahomes, there's just, it's hard to imagine him losing. They've only lost, what, twice? Now, like their last 20 something games. I mean, they're just an absolute juggernaut right now. And I think it'll be close 31 28 is the final I'm picking. So a, a classic on hand in Tampa Bay on Sunday. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't wavered from last week. I'm going with the Chiefs also, but I also think this whole experience has taught us something and that. Who gets a haircut before the biggest game of their life? Uh, you think hockey players are getting all groomed up before the Stanley Cup finals? I mean, the, the Chiefs here got really lucky this week when the positive COVID test from their barber came back when it did. I mean, otherwise, if it came back later in the day, you're looking at possibly having all of your key players, including Patrick Mahomes, isolated or you know worried about missing this game because they were all scheduled to have haircuts before the game as the lights go out behind me. Uh, apparently, there needs to be more superstitions in football, I think. I mean, cut your hair when the season is over. Go with what works. Same socks, same pad, same everything. Get that ring and then go get your hair cut or make changes. Well, so much for the tight bubble if the barber gets in. So um, interesting that either either the the testing worked and, and they found out before they let them in or they just got really lucky one of the two but um look for me yeah i i think the chiefs are gonna win i i think it's a great story brady moving and and getting tampa into the uh into the super bowl and i, I have a soft spot for uh for old guys who are still playing so uh i i like to see it i hope it's a competitive match regardless since I really have no skin in either team. So for me, I like both teams. I like both quarterbacks. I like the way they've done things. Um, just a good game for me. And a big thanks to Joe Fan and Casey Keller for weighing in on our hot topics this week. Moving right along, a very important conversation is next with a woman who made history. Katie Nida is a trailblazer. As a D1 college place kicker, she became the first woman to suit up for a college bowl game in 1999 while attending the University of Colorado. From there, she transferred to the University of New Mexico and became the first woman to play in and score in a bowl game. Her jersey now hangs in the College Football Hall of Fame, but her rise and success didn't come easy. Katie is also a survivor of sexual assault, a heinous crime that was committed by one of her teammates. Please be advised, our interview touches on some tough topics. 
Katie Nida joining me now. First of all, thanks so much for taking the time today. It is is an absolute pleasure to get to meet you this way. Oh, no. Thank you for having me, Michelle. I'm so glad to be here this afternoon. Now, you were kind of thrown really back in the media, in the mix, like in a big <laughs> way this last year, thanks to Sarah Fuller and, and everything she's been able to accomplish. Um, kind of as you were watching that story unfold, Walk me through kind of the feelings and emotions and everything after based everything you've been through to then see her basically kind of follow in your footsteps. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, it was kind of amazing because I had a little bit of a heads up. Um, one of my old coaches from the University of New Mexico was actually a coach at Vanderbilt and he had passed away in May, but I was still, I'm still very close to his family. So um, I was talking to his wife on the phone and she was like, so, you know, Vandy, they're, they're pretty depleted at kicker because of the COVID. And he goes, and she said, they're looking at bringing in, you know, a female soccer player. So I had this little tiny heads up about it and then heard about it. And, you know, it kind of like rolled from there. But it, um, it was crazy because it really did come out of the blue. You know, usually I kind of got my eyes on, you know, the girls who are coming out of high school and whatnot. And this one definitely just sort of came out of the blue at us. So it was a lot of fun to, to get to watch. And it's been so amazing to see the outpouring of support that she's received um, yeah. and everything that she's been doing. I mean, she was invited to the inauguration. You know, sure. she's, she's been she's been getting so much deserved attention. Mm -hmm. um, but a very different situation than what you unfortunately <laughs> kind of faced yourself. Yeah. Um, there's got to be feelings of, of yay, that's great that we've come so far, but also Definitely. it should have been there in the first place. It's a funny thing because sometimes it's hard for me to look back and think that, you know, I've been kicking since before Sarah was born, which freaks me out now to think about. Yeah. And, um, you know, when I got into uh, my first game, it was 2003, which literally I think was when she was born. So it's hard to believe that so much time has passed. And there is an old quote that I used to always keep with me in my locker. And it said, the first through the wall is always bloodied. And it just kind of spoke to how sometimes, you know, um, if you're that first person coming through that, you know, you do, you, you hit that wall and uh, sometimes it leaves some scars and some, some marks. And, uh, you know, mostly I'm just glad that we have moved forward in a positive way. I would never want anybody to have to ever experience some of the things that, um, you know, I did. But I also... Um, you know, always would look back and kind of looked at other female pioneers, particularly female ones, pioneers in general, and just some of the different, uh, you know, uh, kinds of adversity that they face. Because a lot of these stories for people who, when you're the first person occupying a space, um, it isn't all just like rainbows and sunshine. And I think that is always important for, for us to remember that uh, we, we have come, you know, uh, a long way. It's a very special club that you are in and and all of us who have come after you, thank you among the countless women who've made sacrifices and put themselves out there. For myself, looking up to women in these roles, Billie Jean King is one of my, sure. has been one of my idols forever. Is there anyone in particular through your journey that you've really looked up to or been able to develop a relationship with because of the adversity you have felt and the first that you've accomplished? Yeah, you know, that's such a good question, because the other day I, I put something out on social media just uh, as a big thank you, because I, I believe so strongly that, um, you know, especially as women, all of our stories are so connected, and we really are standing on each other's shoulders. So when, um, you know, I'm talking about my own football career, um, there's you know, uh, coming before me was, you know, even a woman named Kathy Clope, who nobody mentions from uh, Louisville, uh, you know, back in like 1995, and Heather Sue Mercer, and then Liz Heaston, and Ashley Martin. And so, you know, there's, there's a sprinkling, and then there's like a whole, um, whole group of women who you just never even hear their, their names mentioned around the, the um, uh, topic of just, 
you know, women who are out there playing. Um, and I think that it, it's sort of funny. Uh, one of the things that came up the other day that's been kind of ironic is I'm from Colorado. And so growing up, um, I my parents always had us paying attention to local sports. And I was a huge Becky Hammond fan because yes. she played at Colorado State. I am the worst basketball player on this planet, but I loved um, Becky Hammond and like her go-to girl was uh, Katie Cronin. So watching the two of them play, it was, uh, you know, amazing. I had them, you know, all over my walls in high school. And so now getting to watch her as she kind of breaks down these new barriers, there's been some really cool irony and just uh, a lot of fun to get to watch her do that. I love that. I think you hit on such a beautiful point that I feel like there's this special bond in sisterhood. And you and I kind of were talking about it a little bit before we started recording about women in sports. And it doesn't matter what our role is as a woman in sports, but we all we all kind of know that unspoken camaraderie with each other. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's so special to watch the stories interchange and connect and and all of that. And I think it's so important to share all aspects of that story. And there were some yes. really beautiful articles that were written when Sarah Fuller was, you know, thrusted into the spotlight this fall and everything she's been able to do at Vanderbilt and whatnot. Um, but you again, telling your truth and that it's not just a sugar-coated, put a bow on it, pretty story. Why do you think it's so important to share the truth? And so people are aware of mm -hmm all sides, the, the good, the bad, and everything in between. Well, obviously, because it, it is the truth. And if we're not telling, uh, you know, truthful stories, I don't know what happens for our next generations as they come up that they think, you know, something is wrong with them because things are happening to them. I know for me, I hadn't heard a lot about, um, you know, other women directly facing the same kind of adversity when I started at CU. And starting to hear those other stories became so incredibly important. And, um, you know, when we're talking about kind of standing together as women in the sports world and other places, I just was thinking of, uh, you know, Jamel Hill, who had been at ESPN for so long. And she, uh, when my book came out in 2006, she was like my first quote unquote, me too the first person who really um, stood up with me in the sports world. And she wrote a story about her own uh, sexual assault. And it was just really powerful thing that, you know, as two uh, women in the sports world, uh, females here together, that she took the time to write about her own experience with that personally and how powerful that was for me. And that that really has stuck with me all, all these years later, you know, we're still, um, friends and it just was uh an incredibly important thing for me to hear and to know her story and again for the two of us to be kind of standing together and you know saying you aren't alone in this as a survivor um obviously you, you can't turn on any news outlet with hearing another horrific story involved in sports sure. not involved in sports about assault domestic violence uh, unfortunately i hate that the list goes on and on what would be your message to anyone out there, male, female, who maybe is sitting on a truth like that within themselves about maybe them feeling like they're not alone? People will believe you because we see it every day, the trouble that survivors are up against. Oh, sure. And thank you for including, you know, men in that uh, area, too. That was something when I was doing anti-violence trainings, uh, particularly with uh, Major League Baseball, I was stunned at the number of men survivors who found me later and spoke to me about their own experiences. So I think that that's something that's really important that we're acknowledging and um, identifying. I think, you know, um, my message always is to just um, make sure to keep going, to know that no matter what's happening on the outside, no matter what they're saying about you, no matter what's going on, there's always, you know, there's something inside of us that I believe nobody else can touch, that there's always this area that is, you know, ours and ours alone. And you know, you know, you know what, um, 
uh, you know, to use your words, what your truth is and what happened. And there is uh, just a part of your spirit that nobody can touch. So if you can find that, hang on to that, even when it feels like it's just a tiny spark, hang on to that and keep going and it will, you know, continue to grow. And I know sometimes it's hard. I mean, it really, really is. There were some really dark times for me, but um, that I think is the most important thing to remember is that they will pass, even though sometimes it feels like it's going on forever. It will get better. It does get better. Beautifully said. And I appreciate you, you being so honest and so, you know, wanting to share that Thank with you. so many people, because I know that that's not easy. That's not easy to do. Um, that aside, um, I'm curious, your overall thoughts on where we are right now as a society with women in sports and welcoming people that maybe aren't your typical people in these set roles into opportunities and and are, are you happy with the progress because it seems like on the last couple of years mm -hmm. we're finally seeing some momentum yeah. forward for marginalized groups being to able to get their chance it's taken a long time. Um, although that's something that I've learned, you know, I'm 15 years out of college now and have been working in social justice, anti-violence stuff since then. And the one thing that I have learned is that real change is slow and it's so easy to get frustrated, but just to know that, you know, sometimes it is like inch by inch we go. And, um, you know, it's like, I, I think sometimes it feels like we're getting there and then it'll feel like we get knocked back a little bit. So, um, you know, we're, we're seeing things happen. I think we'll continue to, and if we can just kind of keep that momentum, keep pushing, you know, the more diversity that we have, um, in leadership roles, whether we're talking about anything from like gender, race, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, all of these things that, you know, the more diversity we can get, the more voices at the table, at that top spot, uh, the better our organizations, the better our sports teams are all going to be, the better our society is going to be. I think, I mean, sports, we've gotten to see what a powerful role they really do play in um, social justice justice and in society these past few years it's been so like remarkable yeah. to watch and encouraging Amazing. and um I mean I as a Seattle girl I've been so proud of the stance that we've seen especially the WNBA I'm oh, a huge yeah. Storm supporter oh, Storm. Oh, yeah. right like mm -hmm. what those women were able to accomplish in their wobble this last year and and trying to bring justice to Breonna Taylor and Black Lives Matter movement and there are bright spots that we have to look to. And um, in football, obviously, Sarah Fuller was a huge bright spot this year. Um, and also another bright spot is Super Bowl 55. We are going to see our first ever female referee in that game. And Sarah Thomas, last year yes. we had, I know, so awesome. Last year we had our first female coaches. This year, female mm -hmm. ref. How excited are you to see? I know the NFL catching on with this and that it's not just college. It's not just, you know, um, flag football. It's not just high school, that at the highest sure. level, women are finally getting an opportunity to be involved. Yeah. Well, for Sarah Thomas, the ref, I think it's so cool because she has just quietly done her thing and has, you know, basically just, you know, uh, done a great job at her job. And sometimes, you know, we don't hear a lot about her because she's just off doing her work. And I think that is so cool. And she's someone who I really look at and I admire a lot because I know she works really hard and she's just, she's tremendous. She's one of those women that you look at and you're just like, Wow, amazing. And it's so cool too to see, you know, with the Bucks, there are going to be two female coaches in there. They're a strength and conditioning coach. And then um, Lo Locust, who's one of the assistant uh, D lineman coaches. And it's just like, it's it's really neat to, to see that. So, I mean, two years in a row, suddenly we've got, you know, these female coaches who are coming up. And, um, uh, you know, it's it's been nice to see how they've started to integrate a lot of these programs with getting more women into the NFL. And I think, you know, we'll continue to to see that, that they've made some purposeful strides and hopefully, um, you know, we'll just continue to see it grow and see women um, taking on 
uh, you know, higher positions and higher, you know, salaries and bigger jobs as, as we keep on going. So, I mean, I'm really psyched to see where Katie Sowers heads up now, you know, where she going to end up. It's cool. Mm -hmm. uh, as we kind of wrap things up here, Katie, um, your message for young girls out there who want to play a game that maybe isn't the game society is telling them to play or the game that they think they're capable of playing, but their heart is somewhere else. What would you say to them? That's it. That heart right there, you know what you are supposed to do. And if you believe in yourself and you work hard, um, I think that anything is, is possible. I really still, still believe that. And I say that having, you know, run into some really strong hurdles in, in my own career. And I think that that's something that is just uh, tremendously important that in the end, you are the one who knows what is right for you. You know, your heart will not lead you astray. So listen to her. Katie, you are such an inspiration. It is such an honor oh, to you. talk to you. Thank you so much for sharing this your time. It's such a pleasure. I mean, Michelle, I can't thank you enough. It's just, um, you know, we've kind of alluded to it. We all kind of are in this together and it's really been um, important and special. So thank you for having me on and for giving me a platform to speak. I appreciate it. Now, if you or someone you know is a sexual violence or assault survivor and need to talk to someone, please consider these providers. The first is RAIN, which is the nation's largest anti-sexual violence network. You can reach someone directly by calling 800-656-HOPE, that's HOPE, or online at www.rainwith2ends.org. And the other is the Joyful Heart Foundation. You can find information about that at joyfulheartfoundation.org. Well, it's time for trivia. Here's the latest on the clock. We're now joined by Michael Barton, who not only responded on Twitter, but you were once on an ESPN trivia show, weren't you? Yes, I was, sir. Uh, back in 94, uh, they had a show called Sports on Tap. Uh, we sat around a bar and answered uh, trivia questions. Uh, Pretty this, fun. Th this is why we're doing general trivia knowledge, because I would get smoked if it was just sports knowledge. Nah, I don't think so, but yeah, okay. <laughs> you know the, you probably know the answers. I don't. No, we'll see about that. We're putting a $100 gift card to Daniel's Broiler on the line today. You have to beat me outright to win. And these questions are provided by The Fish, Jeff Aaron's Fame Trivia USA. So you can check them out at Fame Trivia USA on Facebook. Each of us is going to have a minute to answer as many questions as possible. You're going to go first. I'm going to switch headphones out, uh, as you'll see here. And I'm listening to a little bit of uh, Katy Perry. Right. Okay, so uh, here you go. Jessamyn McIntyre is on the line. Jessamyn, take it away. All right, Michael. All right. Here we go. Are yes, you ready? Yes. Uh, okay. You are officially on the clock. Who always pulls the football away from Charlie Brown before he can kick it? Lucy. What kind of sporting equipment is known as Big Bertha? Golf club. Which planet is known as the Red Planet? Mars. What SNL character was known for the line, isn't that special? Dana Carvey. Or Church Lady. Uh, the what, who is the broadcast partner of Jim Nance on CBS Football? Tony Romo. What hugely popular band was featured in the Rattle and Hum documentary? Uh, you too. What city and state is famous for Jack Daniels Old Number no. Seven whiskey? City and state, Lexington, Kentucky. Kentucky. Joe Biden was sworn in as a president. Donald Trump did not attend, but also not attending the inauguration was the oldest living president, who is now 96 years old. Who is he? Jimmy Carter. All right. Thank you very much, Michael. You did extremely well this time. Let's do it. You are officially on the clock. Who always pulls the football away from Charlie Brown before he can kick it? Lucy. What kind of sporting equipment is a Big Bertha? Uh, driver, golf club. What planet is known as the red planet Mars? Oh my goodness, okay. Keep Which going. SNL character was known for the line, isn't that special? Uh, pass. Who is the broadcast partner of Jim Nance on CBS Football? Uh, uh, Tony Romo. 
What hugely popular band was featured in the Rattle and Hum documentary? Pass. What city and state is famous for Jack Daniels Old Number no. 7 Whiskey? Uh, Nashville. Joe Biden was sworn in a president. Donald Trump did not attend, but also not attending was the oldest living U.S. president, who is now 96 years old. Jimmy Carter. What is the brand name for the best-selling peanut butter in the U.S. as selected by, quote, choosy moms? Uh, Skippy. He smoked you, Aaron. It didn't matter. <laughs> did he really? Yeah, he got all but one right. Nice. We yes. have a winner, Michael Barton. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you so much. You Appreciate are, that was a lot of fun. Where are, we, where are we sending this gift card to? What city are you in? I'm in Sumner, Washington. Nice. Well, shout out to Sumner. Uh, you are our first official winner on the show, and congratulations. Thank you, and shout out to PLU Baseball. And <laughs> go Lutes. Right on. Thank you so much. Well, all streaks are meant to be broken, and Michael killed it today. Lucy pulls the football from Charlie Brown. Big Bertha is a golf club. Mars is the red planet. Dana Carvey said isn't that special on Saturday Night Live. And Tony Romo is Jim Nance's partner on CBS Football. U2 is featured in the Rattle and Hum documentary. Lynchburg, Tennessee is famous for Jack Daniels' old number seven whiskey. And 96-year-old Jimmy Carter could not make Biden's inauguration. I also believe that Jif was the answer to that last question that you heard there. Congratulations to Michael and Michelle. Let's start a new winning streak next week. Aaron, I'm speechless. <laughs> I didn't think the day would come where someone would beat you. Oh my gosh, hats off to Michael. That's amazing. But also hats off to you, Aaron, because what was that? Like 14, 15 in a row? Because I know we've had 16 episodes now, but I don't, do we have trivia on every single one of them? Pretty much, and clearly, I am mortal. I can be beat. I'm not very good at trivia in the overall scheme of things, and Michael proved that today. Oh, that is amazing. Now, if you at home want to take on Aaron and be a part of our trivia of, of On the Clock, just find Aaron at Twitter. That's AaronQ13 at Twitter, and let him know that you want to be a part of it, and you can be featured here on Just a Bit Outside. Well, Aaron, we had no picks last week, but of course, it's Super Bowl Sunday this week. What do you have for us in the latest against all odds? You know, this is the game that gets the most wagers, so I'm not just picking the winner this week. I'm giving you a few prop bets this week as well. Most sports books have the game as a three-point line. I will only take the Chiefs if they're giving up just three points, not three and a half. So keep that in mind. I think both teams are going to score in the first quarter, so take the plus money on that. Travis Kelsey's first reception, I'm going with under ten and a half yards. And the prop bets that are the most important, of course, we've got a duet with Jasmine and Sullivan and Eric Church for the national anthem. I'm going under 118 seconds there. And of course, on the coin flip, tails never fails. Again, this is for entertainment purposes only, but one day we might actually get to place these bets in the state of Washington once these sports books finally open up. Michelle? I wish betting like the Super Bowl could be betting every week. I love betting on like how long a song's going to go and coin flips and everything. That is just so much fun. Thanks for the insight, Aaron. And that does it for us here on this episode of Just a Bit Outside presented by Wafed Bank. Join a best bank. Now remember to check out all episodes of Just a Bit Outside at justabitoutside.fox or wherever you enjoy your podcasts. A huge thanks to Joe, Casey, and Katie for joining the show. For Aaron Levine and our production team, I'm Michelle Ledka saying thanks for hanging out. We'll see you next week.